I want to show you three examples of hypothesis testing of various sorts to give you a feel of the kind of problems that you should now be able to do and to explore some of the wrinkles that come up. Here's my first example. We're interested in testing if dogs, this I have to admit is the grossest example we'll ever do, but I hope you enjoy it. To test if dogs can detect cancer through smell, trained dogs were exposed to seven samples of urine, one of which was from a bladder cancer patient. In 54 trials, the dogs picked out the cancerous sample 22 times. Is this evidence at the 2% significance level that the proportion of times trained dogs get it right is more than, well, what should we make it here? So this is a case where there's no explicit test proportion to compare it to. So they got it right 22 out of 54 times. If they were just guessing randomly, how often would you expect them to get it right? Well, there are seven samples, one of which is from the bladder cancer patient. So presuming that they're each time picking one based on the smell, if you or I were doing this, we would get it right one-seventh of the time because we're not detecting anything. So the null hypothesis here is that they would get it right one-seventh of the time. And the alternate hypothesis, that is that they're detecting something, they're, they're being better than chance at detecting the cancer, is that they would, the proportion of times they detect it correctly is more than one-seventh. So here, the exact problem did not explicitly give a test proportion. The test proportion came from your understanding of what the null hypothesis was, which is that they're guessing randomly, that they're not detecting anything, and a look at the situation. There are seven of them equally likely. Okay, so all of that is to say that our alternate hypothesis is p is greater than one-seventh, and our null hypothesis is p is equal to one-seventh. Is 22 out of 54 a surprising result if p equals one-seventh? That's what hypothesis testing will tell us. What's the formula for the p-value? This is, remember, the second situation, b, which is one minus the norm dist calculation. And what goes in the norm dist calculation? 22 out of 54, the first slot is your data. The second slot is p naught, your test proportion. And the third slot is the standard error, which is assuming the test proportion. So you use p naught times 1 minus p naught divided by n, 1 6 times 6 7 over 5 over 54, because we're assuming the null hypothesis here. That works out to 1.3 times 10 to the negative eighth. Excel writes that as 1.3e minus 8. That's a very small number. It's certainly less than our significance level of 2%. So, since it's less than our significance less level of 2%, the data is significant, and we report. This data is significant evidence at the 2% significance level that the proportion of all tests in which dogs get the correct sample is more than 1 -seventh. Or, equally accurate, a little less precise, but a little more helpful, this data is significant evidence at the 2% level that dogs can detect cancer in these tests more often than you would expect by chance. Let's check the assumptions. Is it a simple random sample? It didn't say. Large population, we would need more than 54 was our sample size. We'd need there more than 1,080. Well, the population is a little funny here, right? It's sets of seven urine samples, but this supply is limited only by the number of people who can provide them and the number of cancer patients, because one of them has to be from a bladder cancer patient, but in any case, surely more than 1,080, so no problem. And finally, the rule of 15. This is a one-sample proportion test, so we use the rule of 15. Uh, and remember, for a hypothesis test, you need n times p naught and n times 1 minus p naught. You can think of these as the expected number of successes and failures, both to be more than 15, this fails. 54 times 1 seventh, 6.3 is less than 15, it's not met. We don't have to check the other one, which would pass, because one failure is enough, we have failed to meet the rule of 15. Let's take another example. The file anorexiafixed.xls contains data on the effect of several treatments on anorexic teen girls. 
treatments for anorexia. In particular, now we've, you may have seen this example in the two sample mean where we compared two treatments, but here we're just going to look at one treatment. Uh, columns C and D give the weights of a sample of anorexic teen girls before and after they received the family therapy treatment. This is a subtle one. Um, this is in fact what we called when we talked about the two sample mean, a matched pairs study. We have two sets of data, the weights before and after, but each weight in one sample is obviously paired with the corresponding weight in the other because they're from the same girl at two different times. So in particular, when you take two measurements of the same individual under different circumstances, you can think of that as a matched pairs situation. Um, so those would be two samples which are of course not independent, they're connected. Um, but what you do with it is very straightforward. You look at the difference. The difference is the amount of weight they gained. And that's in column I. The amount of weight, if it's positive, each girl gained. If it's negative, the amount they lost during the treatment. Um, so the more weight they gained, the more effective you view the therapy as being. Where, of course, negative would mean it isn't effective, or zero. Um, so to say the treatment is effective is, say, on average, girls gain weight during this treatment. That is, the average weight gain is greater than zero. So we turn this into a hypothesis test by taking the difference and asking, if this is, is this evidence that the average weight gain, gain is greater than zero? And you recognize average greater than zero as an alternate hypothesis we can do a test on. So let's test the claim at the 1% level that all teenage anorexic girls would have an average weight gain greater than zero if given this treatment. Our population is all anorexic teenage girls, I should have said that. Our variable is the weight they would gain if given this treatment. We're imagining, we're predicting what would happen if given this treatment. We're viewing the girls that we received, that, that we have data for, as a sample of all possible girls. And the parameter is the average potential weight gain of all teen anorexic girls. Okay, so we're testing the claim. The null hypothesis is that the mu, mu is equal to zero. This is the average of the difference. Our alternate hypothesis is that it's greater than zero. So our null hypothesis has to be that it's equal to zero. We enter the data into the T procedure template, and let's do that together. Well, I'm having a very slow computer lately, so you may this may require some amount of patience. We're going to go to the data files, and we're going to look at anorexiafixed.xls. There were just some problems with the original anorexia file. And now, let's open that up in Excel. and we wait with the spinning beach ball while this comes up. We're going to enter that column of data into the first, sorry, uh, into the first column in the template, which we will have to, again, fire up. And then we will set the null hypothesis, null the test mean to zero, and we will set the um, alternate hypothesis to mu is greater than zero. All right, at last we have the data. Here's column I, family change. So notice if we look at columns D and E, uh, or I'm sorry, C and D. Each girl gives their weight before and their weight after, and the difference is the amount they gained. The first girl gained 11.4 pounds, the second girl gained 11 pounds, and so on. So we're going to copy this data for the weight they gained, and then we're going to go and get the template. We're going to hope that goes a little more quickly. Um, one sample mean procedure. We have a numerical variable, and we have one population.
seem to have lost it there, sorry. We open up in the data tab, we paste into column A. Here's an important point that people are often thrown by. Looks like I got thrown by it. No, no, that's fine, it just took, complained. Uh, if you copy the entire column by clicking on the letter, then you paste the entire column by clicking on the letter. If you copy a range of cells, you should paste the top cell where you want it to go. Okay. I'm going to click on the t-test tab and we were interested in the mean being greater than the test mean and our test mean is zero and our p-value is 0 0.00035 so that's all we needed to get from here at least for now so let's go back to the slides and that's our p-value of 0.035 percent which is less than one percent so this data is significant evidence at the 1% level that the average weight gain of all anorexic girls, teen girls, under this treatment is positive. So let's check the assumptions. I'm going to be going right back. This is why I did not go all the way up to the slideshow. Simple random sample. Again, it didn't say anything about the sample. Large population. Our sample size was 17, so we'd need there to be more than 340 anorexic teen girls in the world. That's certainly met. 0, 0,1540. Here we go. We, nothing about the problem told us the weights were normal, and n is not greater than 40. So we are in the in-between case. n is more than 15, so we have to look at the histogram. So, back to the template we go, click on the histogram tab, and we see a quite symmetric histogram. It is about as symmetric as you could hope a histogram of 17 to be, in my opinion. So we're going to call that fine. Third example. Let's use this as an example of identifying what procedure to use. So we've got a simple random sample of 41 college students who used professors' office hours found an average GPA of 3.5 with a standard deviation of 0.7. Already seeing the word average, being told an average and a standard deviation is suggesting this is going to be a numerical procedure. Um, and of course we know that since we're taking a sample of college students who use professors' office hours, at least one population will be college students who use professors' office hours. And the thing we're taking the average of is the GPA the thing we had to ask each student is who, to, who uses office hours is their GPA. So it's clear that GPA is the numerical variable. If this was all it said, we would clearly be using a one sample mean. But in fact, the next sentence tells us that another sample is taken of 52 college students who don't attend office hours. Their average GPA of 3.1, standard deviation of 1.1. In other words, we have two samples from two distinct populations, students who use office hours and students who don't, and we're comparing a numerical variable between them. So this is clearly a, a two-sample mean procedure. We haven't seen what the test is, but that's the only thing we could possibly be. Um, there we go. We are meant to test at the 4% significance level the claim that whether one uses office hours is related to GPA in college students. So here, although we took two separate samples, we're viewing whether or not you use office hours, naturally, as a variable. Our population is college students, and we're relating the binary categorical variable, whether you use office hours, to the numerical variable of GPA. Those are two different perspectives on the same issue. This is phrased in terms of relating variables. We could just as well have asked for evidence that there's a difference in GPA, average GPA, between those who use office hours and those who don't. Those are the same statement, two different ways to think of it. Okay, that's all prefatory to doing the calculation. Our null hypothesis. 
is that the average GPA for those who use office hours is equal to the average GPA of those who don't, and because the question did not suggest a direction, even though we might think, oh, office hours is going to increase GPA, we're going to follow the question, and yes, looking for evidence for a difference, so we're going to test the claim that the mean, mean GPA for those using office hours is different than the mean GPA of those who don't. We're going to use the two sample mean template, but we better have our data in front of us. So the first sample has 41 college students, mean of 3.5, and a standard deviation of 0.7. So we're going to go to the website. We're going to click on two sample mean. It's a T procedure, numerical variable. And this is moving a little more trippingly, thankfully. We open up the two sample mean, and because we have summary data, we'll put it right here. Our mean was 3.5. We had 41 students in the sample and a standard deviation of 0.7. And this is office hours. And then if we go back and check, the other sample had 52, 3.1, and 1.1. 1 .1. 52. 3.1, oops, 3.1, and 1.1. And most importantly, check use summary statistics so Excel knows to look there. We're looking for evidence that the means are not equal. We did not specify a direction, so we get a p-value of 0 0.0359. Again, we're, since we're not doing a confidence interval, we don't have data, we won't be able to look in the histogram page, we're done with this. So we can return with a clean conscience and go to full screen mode. And we conclude p-value 0.0359. That p-value is less, just barely less than the significance level of 4%. So this is significant. We say this data is significant evidence at the 4% level that there is a relationship between office hour attendance and GPA in college classes. It would be better to say in college students there, since that's our population. I would probably take points off for that, what I just did. Simple random sample. Here's an important point. These were two separate samples. They were both, we're told they were both simple random samples. So this is met, but that's important for the second assumption, which is the large population assumption, because we have two things to check. We need there to be more than 820 college students who attend office hours and 1,040 who don't attend office hours, right? And of course, those are both met, but that's a different calculation than if it had been one sample. Uh, and finally, the 0, 15, 40 rule, we need to check for both samples, but both samples are more than 40, so it's no problem. Okay, and one last thing to say about this, we've Whenever you find an association between variables, uh, you may think, in fact, I do think, that there's a causal connection. I believe that office hours will improve your, going to office hours will improve your grade, but merely establishing that association does not necessarily, um, because this was not an experiment, right? We could have done an experiment, which would have required forcing, randomly dividing your class up, say, into two groups of students and forcing some to attend office hours and refusing to meet with the others, which might be fun, but would not be approved by an IRB. Since this is not a, an experiment, there's the potential for lurking variables. So now's your chance to practice that challenging skill of identifying potential lurking variables. Um, pause this and trying to think of them. I'll give you a hint after a pause. Okay. The hint, as I've said before, particularly when you're talking about people, your population here is college students, the right way to find a lurking variable is to ask yourself what kind of person would have a certain value of the explanatory variable, and then ask how might that person differ in the response variable. So here we're asking what kind of person would be more likely to attend office hours, and how would being that kind of person affect their GPA. 
Okay, so there's one, I think, pretty obvious, and one slightly subtler, perhaps. There are variations on each of these. But basically, the kind of student who attends office hours is a good student, right? They're concerned about their grades, they understand how to study and how to do, do well on the course, and they're willing to put the work in. All of those things could affect their GP in all sorts of ways besides office hours, right? So that is a positive lurking variable. It can, could create the effect that perhaps we're seeing. It could create the impression that office hours were helping when it wasn't. Here's another perhaps subtler one that works in the opposite direction, is the kind of people who go to office hours are the kind of people who need office hours. Right? If you're uh, struggling in the class, you're, you really need, need to do better, so you go suck up your pride and go to the office hours. If you're getting an A, why would you go to the office hours? Right? Why waste your time? Uh, so perhaps weak students go to office hours, strong students don't, and uh, and this might actually cover up a strong effect. It might be office hours is helping, but you didn't see it in your study, or you didn't see very much because of this effect. Both of these effects are actually quite common. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that the difference between people who go to elite colleges and people who don't later in life in terms of how well they do, how much money they make, and things like that, is really about the kind of people who get into elite colleges are the kind of people who will make more money and be more successful later in life. The elite college really isn't benefiting them any, it's just identifying them. Um, that would be a lurking variable very much like the first one we suggested. On the other hand, there's a common problem when people try and measure the effectiveness of hospitals, um, is that often the hospitals that serve the sickest people, they may be doing a fabulous job, they may be the best hospitals, but they won't look like it, because if you look at their outcomes, they're getting sicker people, their outcomes are worse. Um, so perhaps the best hospitals where the sickest people go may look the worst. Same effect might be happening in office hours. And as we said, a random ex an experiment which randomly assigns students to office hours could help set